morning. We welcome everyone into the house of the Lord uh, this Lord's Day morning. We have a few announcements. Uh, we did order some cards from ARPA uh, to send to your elected representatives. A thank you note for Danielle Smith for her stand uh, defending our children and then also for your uh, MLA as well. So those two are there. You will need stamps uh, to send to your local uh, representative. You don't need a stamp for your federal uh, representative, but please take those and encourage uh, those who are governing us. Uh, we remind you that we uh, are meeting again this evening at six o'clock. We invite you to join with us as we continue our study in the book of Jeremiah. And uh, Tuesday morning, the ladies have their prayer time at 11 o'clock. Tuesday evening at 5.30, our council meets. Wednesday at 7 o'clock in the evening, our Bible study and prayer meeting. So uh, do remember those meetings. Next Lord's Day, as we gather together, we uh, are taking our offering for Rendili Outreach in Northern Kenya. So do remember that in uh, your preparation. A reminder that our congregational meeting is March 29th, Good Friday at 12.30 p.m. Uh, and we do have a, a service scheduled at, at 11 o'clock for Good Friday. And um, uh, so please remember, especially the congregational meeting, March 29th. And we'll have information on that in the next a few weeks. The Lord calls us to worship from Psalm 147. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is comely. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcasts of Israel. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. God greets you from 1 Thessalonians 1. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And let us turn to hymn number 89, and uh, let us stand to sing praise to our God, come thou almighty King. <laughs> Let's pray. Once again, O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we come into thy presence with joy and with gladness. Thou art our God. 
Thou hast made us, thou hast saved us, thou hast redeemed us from our sin. Thou hast set us apart for a work of thy Holy Spirit. Thou dost desire us to be holy, and we ourselves desire to be holy in our inmost parts. We pray this day that we may look unto thee, that we may learn of thee, that we may desire that thy name alone be honored in this place that we may sing thy praise. We thank thee for our worthy Savior who died for our sins. We thank thee for a love so great and victorious over sin and death. We thank thee that our Savior is seated at thy right hand. We thank thee for his concern and interest in our worship this day. We seek thy help, O Lord. Our hearts, our minds are flooded with many distracting thoughts. We pray, Lord, that we may be focused upon thee, that we may look unto thee, that we may worship thee alone, that we may love and adore thee. We pray that thou wouldst forgive us our sin, cleanse our hearts even now. We pray, Lord, that thou would send the, thy, thy Holy Spirit to set us apart, that we may honor Christ our Savior. We pray in his precious name. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, let us turn in our Bibles to Psalm 124. Psalm 124. The Song of Degrees of David. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who hath not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let us turn in our hymnals to number 111. This is from Psalm 65.
us turn in our Bibles now to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. This is the law of our God, the moral law, the summary of God's righteousness, his holiness, a reminder that we uh, cannot obey these laws and will never, no man ever will obey these laws in order to save themselves, but the Lord Jesus Christ obeyed these laws so that others could be saved because he already was uh, in heaven. He's already the Godhead. So uh, what great love there was that God sent Jesus uh, unto the earth to obey from the heart. His very meat, his very food was to please his heavenly Father. So let us read these laws which are the desire of each of God's people though we are unable to attain them. This is the word of God. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And uh, when a young lawyer was sent by the Pharisees to tempt the Lord, asking him which is the greatest of all the commandments, the Lord Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And he was quoting Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And again, he's quoting from the Old Testament, Leviticus 19, 18. Nothing new here, something even the lawyer should have known. Jesus said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let us turn in our bulletin to uh, the confession of our faith. And uh, most of these are, or many of them are considerably longer than our catechism uh, answers, but they are filled with a very a profitable meat and things worth thinking about. Paragraph five of the first chapter of our confession. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture and the heavenliness of the matter 
the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, the many other incomparable excellencies, and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to be the word of God. Yet notwithstanding our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. And uh, let us recite John 16, 13 to 14. How be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. John 16, 13 to 14. And uh, what a good reminder for all of us in these days where there's often a, a misunderstanding of the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is to direct our hearts, yours and mine, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, when you are affected towards Christ, when you have desires towards Christ, when you want to please him and honor him, then that is the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. Uh, we look for other signs often, other evidences, but that is the very work of the Holy Spirit. He's going to, Jesus said, he doesn't talk about himself. Uh, he'll show you the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, we see the evidence of his work there. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. O oh Lord our God, how wonderful thou art, how great and glorious, how loving and compassionate, how full of loving kindness thou art towards thy covenant people. We thank thee, O oh Lord, that thou hast given us thy truth, that thou hast shown us the things that are right and true. And we thank thee that they are not uh, merely a stone letter to us, but that they're they are opened unto us by the power of thy Holy Spirit. O oh Lord our God, we need the opening of our eyes. How quick we are to judge thy word. How quick we are to not understand or right. How quick we are to often shut our scriptures. And yet we know, Lord, that that is the very word of truth. Lord, send thy spirit that we may have our eyes open, that we may behold thy word as thy truth, that we may embrace it, accept it, and love it, that we may cherish it in our hearts and meditate upon it often. We pray, O Lord, that it may be in all of our thoughts, guiding us through each day. We pray that thou wouldst grant unto us thy good instruction for our hearts, so often sick of sin and weary of iniquity. O Lord, we pray that thou would strengthen us, Set us upon the solid rock of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law, that it may be our chief delight. O oh Lord, we pray that thou wouldst grant that thou wouldst be mindful of us as a people gathered to worship thee. We pray that thou wouldst be with those who are, are unable to be with us. We pray for our shut-ins. We ask that thou wouldst be mindful of them. I pray for Dave and Pat Stone on vacation. Wilt thou bless them in this time away? Grant a good visit with their children. We ask that thou wouldst uh, be merciful uh, to them and return them home safely as well. We pray for Wanda who has not been feeling well. And for others, we ask that thou would strengthen them in uh, their body as well as in their soul. We ask, Lord, that thou wouldst be pleased to re remember us. We pray that... Thou be merciful to us. Fill this uh, building, we pray, with uh, voices and joyful singing of praise to uh, our Savior. We pray uh, this day that thou wouldst uh, remember those who rule over us. O oh Lord, our God, we, we grieve at the state of our nation. 
rivers of water flow down our eyes because they keep not thy law. They have rebelled. They have done wickedly. We pray, Lord, that thou would restore righteousness to our nation. We pray that those who govern our land may indeed punish evildoers and reward those who do good. Lord, we see far too often the, the punishing of those who do good. We pray, O oh Lord, that thou would deliver us from the, this great evil and this wickedness. We pray that there would be a return to thy word, a return to thy law, a return to thy holiness. We pray for thy covenant people spread throughout this land where they proclaim the goodness of thy grace unto sinners. And we ask, O oh Lord, that thou would strengthen them in faith, that thou wouldst be pleased to make thy church to be steadfast in its gospel testimony, and that thou wouldst be pleased to uh, grant that we may not be weary in well-doing, but that we may be joyful in our service uh, of thee and towards others. We pray, O oh Lord, that uh, thou wouldst uh, grant repentance and respect for the office. Lord, we pray for our leaders that we may lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and honesty. We pray for our premier this morning and ask that thou wouldst be pleased to Grant that uh, she may uh, be stalwart and strong in her defense of uh, our children. And we pray, Lord, that thou would lead her further in the way of godliness, that she may be even stronger to assert those things which are right and true before thee. We pray, Lord, for our members of parliament, our members of the legislative assembly. We pray for our, our prime minister, our governor general, our king, we ask that thou wouldst have mercy upon them. Lord, we ask that thou wouldst remember also uh, the judges of our land, the police officers who are often tasked with a very difficult work and often not supported by judges. We ask that thou wouldst have mercy upon them, give them strength and wisdom and discernment. We pray, O oh Lord, that thou wouldst uh, remember those who are serving in our military. We pray for um, faithful military and prison chaplains in service to thee. We thank thee, Lord, for the work of uh, Reverend Gerard. Even though he's retired, we pray that thou hast blessed seeds that he has planted in his time in the chaplaincy. We remember also this day um, Mark Baldwin and the saints at Trinity Church in Weed, California. Wilt thou encourage them? Wilt thou bring souls into their midst to uh, worship with them and to join with them in gospel witness and testimony. Lord, we ask that thou wouldst uh, be pleased to be gracious unto us also. Will thou be pleased to receive now our tithes and offerings, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we will at this time receive our tithes and offerings.
remain standing to recite the Apostles Creed which is found in the beginning of your uh, the front of your hymnals or in the handout for your bulletin this morning Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord who is conceived by the Holy Ghost born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let's turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. Two. And as we come once again to the Supper of the Lord, in conjunction with the preaching of the Word, we are reminded that uh, the table is to be fenced, that it is not for everyone, but that it is for those who are born again, first of all, repented of your sins, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ that you have uh, received the waters of baptism as a testimony to your saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you are not living in secret or unrepentant sin, sin that you harbor in your heart known sins, and that you are, if you're visiting currently, a communing member uh, in good standing of a reformed or evangelical church and that you have not been excommunicated or asked by your church to refrain from taking communion. So uh, these are the, the um, parameters, the fencing of the table. Uh, it is not a judgment on anyone who uh, uh, is visiting, is, does not partake, but uh, we do want to honor the Lord in these things, and we thank you for respecting our observation of the Lord's table. Turning to Jeremiah chapter 2, we will begin reading at verse 1. We will look particularly at verses 9 through 19. This is the word of God. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the firstfruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt? And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. 
The priests said not, where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Shittim and see, and send unto Kedar, and consider diligently, and see if there be such a thing. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? The young lions roared upon him and yelled, and they made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitant. Also the children of Noph and Tahapanes have broken the crown of thy head. Hast thou not procured this unto thyself, in that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, when he led thee by the way? And now what hast thou to do in the way of Egypt, to drink the waters of Sihor? Or what hast thou to do in the way of Assyria, to drink the waters of the river? Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter, that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we pray that we may, by thy Spirit, receive the good things of thy word. We pray that we may be open to thy instruction, thy reproof. We pray that we may be turned unto the Lord Jesus Christ, that he alone may be our hope and our great Savior. Bless now, we pray, the preaching of thy word in preparation for the supper of the Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the case of unbiblical or unjustified divorce, there's often a pleading on the part of the one who has been wronged to reconcile, to make things right once again. We saw last week that the Lord has grounds for divorce. He's not going to pursue them to their logical end, but his wife has been unfaithful. She, he has grounds for divorce. Uh, Matthew 19, Jesus says that, that an adultery is legitimate grounds for divorce. And the Lord says, you have been unfaithful. And yet here he pleads with her. Now he doesn't cast her off. You can think of the seriousness of adultery, which is so prevalent in our land, the breaking of a marriage covenant by sexual unfaithfulness is so abhorrent, is such a terrible and a horrible sin that the Lord Jesus says that is grounds for divorce. And God says, I hate divorce. You've broken a trust. And that relationship, by the way, should be reconciled. It's good if it can be reconciled. There should be love and devotion there. Trust will need to be built up again. Uh, adultery doesn't mandate divorce by any means. But it is a just cause for divorce. Uh, such a great trust has been broken. Such great promises have been broken. But here the Lord says, I want you back. And he pleads with her. And uh, that's what we see here in verse uh, 9. Wherefore I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord. And with your children's children will I plead. I'm not done with you yet, even though you've acted so miserably against me. Even though you have rejected all of my ways, I'm pleading with you to return to the former ways, to remember 
who I am and what I have done for you. So he speaks in verses 10 to 13 of an unthinkable idolatry. Uh, they've gone to worship other gods and he presents it in such a way that it is completely ridiculous that they would do such a thing. Don't you see what's happening? He says, look around. Look to the east, to Cyprus. Look to the west, to Qadar. And look around all of the religions as far as you can see, as far as you can know and discover. Look diligently, uh, he says, verse 10, pass over the isles of Shittim, that's Cyprus, and see and send unto Qadar and consider diligently if there, see if there be such a thing. Examine this, look closely. Uh, I invite you. What is he inviting them to discover? Verse 11, hath a nation changed their gods which are yet no gods. All of these nations hang on to their gods. They love their Baal. They love their Molech. They, and they, they hang on. They haven't changed. And isn't that true of the world today? Has Islam ever traded Allah for another god? They're pretty consistent. I and mean, they've got their factions and divisions. They all confess Allah. As he's revealed in their holy Quran. It's not holy, but they call it holy. Has Buddhism forsaken Buddha? Or Confucianism exchanged Confucius and said, well, you know, that didn't really work out so well for us. Maybe we should try something else. Or do they hang on to those leaders, which God says, they're not gods. They profess to be God, they're not gods at all. Which is what Paul reminds the, uh, the uh, I, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 8, 4, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and there is none other God but one. We can think of the gods of Rome and Greece. We still know the myths, we still know that those gods have not changed. And our God has not changed, but God says my people's attitude towards me has changed. Those gods haven't done anything. The gods of the religions of the world are extremely demanding. Uh, even though they present their doctrines in terms of love and peace, very often, not always, but they are extremely demanding. All of the religions of the world are religions that give you salvation by your good works. And they're very demanding of those good works. He says it's, it's ridiculous to think. Um, Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. These people continue, continue faithful to their gods, which are not really gods. But my people have had everything. My people have departed from what they have. They have exchanged their glory. They knew the true and the living God, the only God that exists, a glorious God, a God that's uh, amazing, uh, that, a God that demonstrated his love and his faithfulness to the smallest of all nations. We considered Deuteronomy 7 uh, earlier this morning. Um, God said, I didn't choose you because you are the greatest of all the nations. I chose you because I loved you. Uh, this, your size had nothing to do with it. My determination, my resolve, my decree from before the foundation of the world is what stands. And so easily we compare ourselves to those around us. And there's something somehow attractive in those other religions. And they're often very attractive to the people of God. Why can't we do things the way they do them? Why can't we have this doctrine? Why can't we change this? 
And the only way that that can happen, beloved, is if we've taken our eyes off of the glory of God. We have ceased to be amazed at God's work, his providence, but above all, his attributes, his very being, that we should behold our God in who he is and then find it irrelevant. Uh, be very dismissive of it. Well, you know, this doesn't really matter. I've heard this before, and it's just kind of a repeated thing. Instead of delving into it as something that is far beyond my grasp, far beyond my very narrow and limited and human and finite understanding, there are things here that I cannot possibly understand. And... I must because that's who God is. I want to because that's who God is. So the world is not going to look favorably on that. John Calvin says, it is then the same as though Jeremiah had said that all the nations would condemn the Israelites at the last day because their very persistency and error would prove the greater wickedness of the Jews inasmuch as they were apostates from the true God and from that God who had so dearly, clearly manifested to them his power. So here's God who said, I'm setting you apart as the smallest nation to show the whole world how powerful I am. And remember that he did that by taking this little group of people, uh, maybe we're estimating two million, half a million men, two million people perhaps, out of Egypt, the greatest world power that existed at that time. They were, they were in the clutches of Pharaoh. They were in the grasp of Pharaoh. They did the bidding of Pharaoh. And God says, now you're going to leave. And Pharaoh couldn't stop him. The chariots and armies and horses of Pharaoh could not stop God from delivering his people. And he showed them what a great God, he showed the whole world what a great God he was said even the city of Jericho, 40 years later, they were still talking in amazement about God's great deliverance of Israel from Pharaoh. And Rahab knew that she had to uh, connect with God's people. So there's a great glory here of the God who is. And beloved, you and I as God's people need to be devoted to the study of who God is. When you're no longer amazed, when you're no longer really filled with that desire to worship him, it's because you no longer know him. You no longer are marveling at his greatness, at his ability to do all things according to his own will. God even calls on all of nature to condemn this foolishness. Verse 12, be astonished, O ye heavens, at this. Be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. Uh, this is shocking that my people, after I have poured out upon them all my love, all of my affection, all of my blessing, all of my benefits, and promised these things to them through eternity, that they should just turn their back on them, on, on, on me that has given them all these things. Are you amazed? And remember that we said that the language that Jeremiah is using here is the language of a courtroom, the language of a lawsuit. So here, in terms of this lawsuit, he's calling the heavens as witnesses. You, you've been up there, stars, moon, uh, you've seen all this, um, and you ought to be afraid that people who have been so blessed and set apart would rebel against that goodness. The Lord says, you've committed two evils in verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, cisterns that can hold no water. So they had Christ. They had the fountain of living water. The only God, the true and the living God. The one who had 
condescended from the heights of heaven to come and reveal himself to them. If you turn over to Jeremiah 17, where we often quote the verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Further down in verse 13, he says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. So they've got the basic necessity of life is water. Far more important, isn't it, than food even. We can't go so long without water. Psalm 36, 9, for with thee is the fountain of life. Isn't that the beautiful way in which the Lord Jesus presented himself to the woman at the well? Uh, let's turn over there to John chapter 4. It bears our, our uh, reading together. John chapter 4. And there he is asking about water. And um, verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. She confronts him and goes back and forth. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of, springing, of water springing up unto everlasting life. And there's further interaction there with this woman. And eventually she's so convinced that he is indeed the Messiah of the Jews that she leaves her water pot behind and says, I need to tell my fellow citizens that I've found the Messiah, that I've found the living water that will never, uh, you will never have to drink again. So here is the is the beauty of the description of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I am the living water. I am. Whosoever drinks from me will never thirst again. But they've cast that off. The Jews have cast that off. So often the church of the modern day casts that off, trusting in their own works. They have hewed cisterns. They have huge cisterns, and I don't think we have cisterns as much as we used to. We had a cistern when I was a little boy uh, in our home. But here, I think when, I, when we had our cistern, even 60-some uh, years ago, uh, 70 years ago, we had a cement cistern. They would a truck. I don't know if they had cement mixers in those days, but they would have mixed up cement and poured it in and they would have made a cistern to hold water. And here the Lord accuses his people of hewing out cisterns from stone. They take a hammer and a chisel, they a big rock, and they, they chisel down to make a cistern to hold water. And in the process of that, it turns out that there was a crack in the cistern. The cistern broke, they filled it up with water, and maybe not right away, but eventually the water drains and it seeps into the ground because there's a crack in it and it's not holding water. So first problem, you've hewn cisterns for yourself. I have, I am the living water, God says. I am the living water, Jesus says, and yet, you want to make your own place to hold water. And what's the big difference there? So a cistern is a cavity where you pour water into and store water. 
And if you don't use it right away, it's going to become stale water, isn't it? You've got to put something over it to protect it and keep it clean. And the Lord Jesus is more like, if we can use an earthly illustration, more like an artesian well, just bubbling up from the ground, just coming up and continually being fresh, continually providing that, that uh, for, for your thirst. A beautiful, beautiful picture. And the people of God, though they have that artesian well, though they have the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, let's make our own well to store water. And they've worked hard at it. It's not an easy thing to chisel away at rock until you have a, a huge a cavern that's worth holding some water. They worked hard at it. And again, we can compare the religions of the world and even some forms of Christianity that really emphasize the whole idea of works, work hard. You've got to sweat. It's not bad to work hard for the kingdom of Christ, beloved. But we cannot work for our salvation. You cannot work for your salvation. There's nothing that you can do that will please God. Is there a more pleasant religion in the whole world? than to simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not easy humanly, is it? Humanly speaking. You don't need a savior if you're not a sinner. So each of God's people have gone through that list of the Ten Commandments that we read earlier. As they read the Ten Commandments, guilty, 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 ten times, guilty. I've offended God. Just in case you think maybe you've been pretty good at two or three or four of them, James reminds us that if you've offended in one point of the law, you've offended them all. You've broken one law, that cistern is cracked. It's not going to hold any water. You don't need 10 cracks. You just need one. You've offended, and it's not going to hold water. It's not going to quench your thirst. It's not going to be profitable to you. And that's the state that you and I are in, beloved, on our own. That we have offended a holy God. That he doesn't look upon us with any kind of affection if we stand by ourselves. And so yet, the religions of the world, and as I said, many forms of Christianity will say you have to work, you have to do something. What a hideous doctrine it is that Christ has done everything for your salvation except for the top 1%, except for that little top thing there. And if you can just decide for Christ, he's yours. But he's waiting for you. He can't save you without your permission. Does that sound like the God of the Bible? Is it kind of stepping back and waiting? Oh, I really would like you to do this, but I can't do anything. I can't save you until, until you save yourself, until you make the final decision, until you take some action. No, you do have to take action. You do have to believe. But that very faith comes from God. That very belief comes from God. And if there's anything to make you and me worship the Lord, it's that very thing, isn't it? That God would bring us into salvation. That he would not just say, okay, you're saved, and then walk away from us and say, we'll see you in heaven. No, he saves that soul. He regenerates. He brings new birth and new life into that soul so that they desire holiness. They desire to repent. They hate their sin. And they desire to have fellowship with God once again. There's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He changes the heart. Then he works on that heart to make them more and more and more holy. So that in time, and not very short time, uh, but over their whole life, they're producing the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. All of these things are being produced in their hearts. And they are being conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're less and less like the world, more and more like their Savior. 
is a blessing of the gospel. And to be holy is a pleasant thing. To flee from sin is a pleasant thing. And yet here we are so often hewing out cisterns, working hard to try to please God. We ought to please God, but out of a thankful heart. You're not a taskmaster that stands over you like the Pharaoh did with the Egyptians with his whip, just waiting for you to make a mistake. And so just, just try it, buddy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you. That's not, that's not grace. Grace brings you along. Does he discipline you? Absolutely he disciplines you because he doesn't like to see the sin in you. But he does it out of the most compassionate love that you can imagine. What a great place it is to be in the center of God's will, as people say. To, be, to belong to the Lord. So it's a very tragic picture when people, Christians, abandon that and turn to good works. It's beautiful to say that salvation is a free gift of God. All it requires is repentance. Right? And we won't do that apart from God turning your heart. You don't want to turn from your sin until God changes your heart. So they've trusted in their own works. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the living water, fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. It looks like the fountain of living waters, but it's not. It's stale water, and we can do better than God. That's the attitude that's there. They end up reverting to slavery. Verse 14, is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? God has freed you. Look back to what he did. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, the preface to the Ten Commandments. I have redeemed you. I have set you free from the bondage of Egypt. To to Israel and to the church, he says, I have set you free from the bondage of Satan, from the bondage to sin, from the bondage of love to the world. I've set you free from all of that. Why are you acting like a slave now? Why are you acting as if I did nothing? And why are you even reverting to that whole way of life? So it's a rhetorical question, are you a slave? Of course, nobody wants to be thought of as a slave. But God says, I want you to think about that because as far as I'm concerned, you're acting now like a slave. You're turning a gospel of grace into a gospel of works. So there is unthinkable idolatry. In the remaining verses, we have unreasonable iniquity, verses 14 to 19. So what happened to your freedom, God asks. He freed them from slavery to Egypt. He'd singled them out over all the nations of the earth. But your life has become miserable. The young lions roared upon him and yelled, and they made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitant. And that's what happened. Second um, Kings 17, 25 says, And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them which slew some of them. So literally that happened. But here the Lord then, if you're going to abandon the Lord, he's going to put you in that place where everybody's your, your enemy. Uh, the, the wicked flee when, there's, when no man pursueth. Because everything, everything turns into guilt. Everybody's against me. Everybody's opposed to me. And here's the clincher. God is not for me. Right? The Christian will say, well, God is for me. All the world may be against me, but God is for me. But this wicked person can't even say God is for me. He says, I'm being pursued by lions. My, my life is miserable. Uh, your land is being made waste and burned, and your life can be made waste and burned. If you're going to turn away from the living, satisfying waters of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he says, you haven't gained any help from the nations around you. Verse 16, also the children of Noph and Tehapanes have broken the crown of thy head. 
You've messed with uh, Memphis and Egypt, that's a translation of Noth, and Tahapanes, you, they, they've ended up breaking your skull. Like it didn't do you any good. Why did you make these alliances with these uh, nations? They haven't helped you. Neither have Egypt or Assyria quenched your thirst. Hast thou not procured this unto thyself? Uh, let's look at verse 18 first. And now what hast thou to do in the way of Egypt? To drink the waters of Sihor? Or what hast thou to do in the way of Assyria? To drink the waters of the river? So you've made the cistern, this cavern, to hold water. Okay, that didn't hold water. So what about drinking of the waters of Egypt or Assyria? The muddy, filthy waters that they have. Let's try that. So you've got clear, sparkling, pure spring water that will never go away in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you're looking, let's see, what does Egypt have? What does Assyria have? Maybe they will, maybe, maybe their water is tasty. Notice how the Lord uses that analogy of the water still working in them, right? What, what are you doing in Egypt? What are you doing to follow the ways of the world? Beloved, when the church dallies with the world, it dies. It dies spiritually. It might, they might have massive buildings. They might attract huge crowds. But the Spirit of the Lord is not there. They can quote Bible verses out of context. They can hold to a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. And God is not present with them if they do not have the gospel. Now remember, just because the church is large doesn't mean it's, it's uh, apostate, right? God blesses some large churches as well, and that's a good thing. He has in the past, he does today. But always examine, it. the size of the church isn't the reason for its success or its faithfulness, its doctrine is. So what does it teach? What do they believe there? What do they proclaim? What do they praise God for? But we go after the ways of the world. This is what happens in the business model. Let's introduce that into the church so that we can have church growth, so that we can be expansive, so that we can be successful. Because we're not measuring success anymore by the word of God. We're measuring it by the metric that the world uses. We'll use their measuring stick to see if the Church of Christ is prevailing. And there's vanity, just vanity in that. Peter says that while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. So they, they talk about great liberty, but they end up putting you into great corruption. Charles Spurgeon said, why should you want to go in the way of Egypt to want to drink of that water? Is not God enough? Do you want another eye beside that of him who sees all things? Is his heart faint? Is his arm weary? Is his eye grown dim? If so, seek another God. But if he be infinite, omnipotent, faithful, true, and all-wise, why gaddest thou abroad so much to seek another confidence? Why do you rake the earth to find another foundation when this is strong enough and broad enough and deep enough to bear all the weight which you can ever build thereon? Christian be single in your faith. Have not two trusts but one. Believer, rest only on thy God and let your expectation be from him. What a tremendous reminder of how easy it is. Why do those things look so attractive to us? Because we're still struggling with sin. Why do we need the word of God to keep us directed to Christ? To keep us to remembrance that he is a worthy savior, a complete savior, an entire savior, that he is our only foundation. That God, in the words of the Old Testament, has taken us out of the muck of sin and set us upon a solid rock. Not the quicksand where we're kind of trying our best to, 
to stay level, but we're just sinking deeper and deeper. And the Lord picks us up and says, here you are on solid rock. What a great feeling that is. What a great feeling it is to be on solid ground uh, uh, again and to be, rather than to be uh, helpless. We were at the swimming pool this week and my wife got a cramp in both her legs on the deep end of the pool. And she just said, I need help, I need help. So just slowly brought her over to the, to the uh, solid ground of the concrete, the tile on the bottom, and felt much better. There she was where she, could, where she could stand, where she could be sure of her footing. What a horrible feeling that would have been to just not, not be able to hang on to anything at all except water. It doesn't really hold you up very well. The Lord says, you brought all this upon yourself. Verse 17, hast thou not procured this unto thyself in that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God when he led thee by the way? Not my fault. God says, you abandoned me. I haven't moved. You brought this upon yourself. We'll look more at backsliding this evening, but Jeremiah says, beware of that backsliding. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter, that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. There's a danger, always a danger of backsliding. And beloved, you and I need to be reminded that that is a danger. We can't stand on our own. We can't stand by ourselves. We need Christ at all times. We need God's mercy and compassion. But how easily we become self-confident. Isn't it often the times when the Lord blesses you the most that you feel like you don't need him anymore? How foolish our hearts are. How wicked we are to even suggest that rather than to see all the blessing of the Lord and turn in praise and thanksgiving to him for all the good that he's done for us. Rather than, than say, well, I've got it from here, Lord. Thanks for getting me out of the deep end. Now I'm on the, on the solid rock. I'm, I'm, I can take it from here. You can't. You can't take it from here. You're just going to end up in the muddy water again. You're going to end up in the deep end again without his help. So as we come to this wonderful table, this table has been set for you, beloved, by a loving Christ, a loving Savior, one who delights in your soul because he saved your soul, one who loves you let us repent of of our own idolatries hewing out broken cisterns trying to make a place for some water that's not the living water let's repent of looking to the world for help the ways of the world the wisdom of the world psychology of the world suggestions of the world, the quote-unquote wisdom of the world always seems wise, seems like a good idea, even though we know yeah, it just isn't quite conform to God's word, but you know, maybe we, I can make it work unlike everybody else. Our, your wisdom, beloved, not only is found in God's word, it is in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification. And let us repent of our backsliding ways for not having sought the Lord as we ought to, for having trusted in ourselves, trusted even in the counsel of others who are not giving godly counsel. With the Lord's help, beloved, let us be resolved to guard against this sin. It's very gradual. It doesn't come upon you overnight. It doesn't come up and strike you on the side of the head. It's very, very subtle gradually leads you away into a place that is not healthy for your soul. And even now, beloved, you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're backslidden in heart, the Lord will receive your repentance. 
your sorrow for your sin, will forgive you, will cleanse you. And the sacrament is meant to do that, meant to re remind you. As you hold that bread, you're going to hold physical bread in your hand. It's real. It's real bread. The forgiveness of God in Christ is just as real. We, we can't see it sometimes, and sometimes we don't feel it. And that's a problem that we have as, as humans. We don't feel forgiven, even though the Lord says, I forgave, I've confessed my sin, I felt awful for my sin, I've brought it before the Lord, and I've claimed the blood of Christ, but I don't feel forgiven. Well, that doesn't matter if you are forgiven. These are the subtleties that we deal with as, as Christians and as, as finite beings that are living, desiring to live for Christ. So let us repent of our, our ways and seek the Lord's ways. And the Lord has given this to sustain us, to strengthen us. He's given us these physical things, uh, bread and wine, to remind us that our forgiveness is real, our salvation is real, that the work of Christ upon the cross was real, that there's a spiritual meaning to it. Our salvation is not in the bread and wine. Our salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now as we partake together, beloved, we remember that we're looking to Christ. You're going to have a cup of wine in your hand. You're going to have a bit of bread in your hand. That's not your salvation. If you're not looking to Christ, you're not, you're not doing it right. This is meant to direct your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, to give you that assurance of the forgiveness of your sins, that it is real and that it is true. So let us turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to read the words of institution.